Look at your passage this morning, Genesis chapter 16. It can be found in your pew Bibles on page 21. Genesis chapter 16. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai his, wolf, wife, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now a child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your, save, or the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Vir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had borne. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. As far as the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. Coram Deo. What is that? Well, R.C. Sproul was once asked by a friend, what's the big idea of the Christian life? He was interested in the overarching, ultimate goal of the Christian life. What's it all about? And to answer this question, R.C. Sproul fell back on his theologian Latin language and said the big idea of the Christian life is Coram Deo. Coram Deo captures the essence of the Christian life. So what does Coram Deo mean? I'm guessing that's what you want to know, right? The phrase literally refers to something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. To live Coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God. To the glory of God. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing, and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. God is omnipresent. There's no place so remote that we can escape His penetrating gaze. And so we live. Not only with the acknowledgement that the reality is we live before God and He sees all, but we live with the acknowledgement in our own hearts, a desire to live before the face of God. Well, this is a, a good passage to talk about this concept of Coram Deo. Because it falls right after that wonderful passage in Genesis 15, where Abram believes in God, and God credits that belief as righteousness, and, and God 
creates a covenant sanction, a covenant. He, he, he ratifies the covenant he's made with, with Abraham in Genesis 15. And he says, as he passes through these chopped up animals, essentially, if I don't keep this covenant, may I be cut off. May I be cursed. And that's kind of how the book of Genesis is, right? Wow, look at the faith of Abram. Wow, he's given his wife to Pharaoh in Egypt. Wow, look at the faith of Abram. He did not fall into the hands of these worldly kings. He saved his, his uh, nephew Lot from being captured. He, he, he dealt wisely with his nephew Lot and said, take whatever land, and he kept the better portion, right? And, 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 in, and in Genesis 15, the whole point of justification by faith alone, the whole point that, that Abram is the father of the faithful, he believed that God would grant him a son of his very own loins. He believed that, and God credited that faith as righteousness. And then Genesis 16 is a moment in which we could say the characters involved are not living before the face of God. They're not living with the acknowledgement that whatever we do and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. But what's interesting is the way that God is involved in this situation. How he shows up in Genesis 16. Our theme this morning is God is gracious to us in Christ even when we live by sight and not by faith. Because that's really what's going on here, isn't it, in Genesis chapter 16. This is a moment following on the heels of Genesis 15, that great expression of Abraham's faith, where this family, Abram and Sarai, begin to doubt, begin to worry, begin to question how it is exactly that God is going to accomplish what he's promised. So that what they do is they begin to live by sight. They begin to, to seek to bring about God's promise by their own work, by their own effort, and not by faith. And that's our first point this morning. Abram and Sarai live by sight, verses 1 through 6. They live by sight. This first part of this passage this morning, verses 1 through 6, the thing that we find out that should be very shocking to us it should help us, in some sense, to be able to relate to the kinds of stress and frustration that Sarai is experiencing, that Abram is experiencing, right? And it's what we read in verse 3. After Abram had been living in Canaan ten years. Ten years. Ten years... Since God said to him, Abram, Eliezer of Damascus will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And he took him out of his tent, and he told him to look up at the sky, and he said, look at the stars in the sky, Abram. That's how numerous your descendants are going to be, if you can count them. That's how numerous your descendants are going to be. I mean, it's a great promise. It's an amazing promise. And 10 years go by. And the whole time, I don't know, maybe one year went by and they thought, it's going to happen eventually. Two years went by and they thought, any time now and Five years go by, and they start getting a little nervous, and seven years go by, and, and Sarai's thinking, I'm not getting any younger, and, and ten years go by, and, and, and how is this possibly going to come about? 
Abram is 86 years old. How is this promise going to come about? And so, Sarai thinks, well, maybe, maybe this is what God intends. Maybe I can give you my maidservant, Hagar. And this is a common practice during those days, right? That a, a, a maidservant of the wife would be given to the husband in marriage, and the children of the husband and that maidservant would belong to Sarai. They would be the children of Sarai. Okay, they would be the children of the wife. And so she says, maybe this is what God intends. Maybe this isn't happening because we're looking at this the wrong way. Maybe we need to get involved. Maybe we need to put a little bit of effort in, put a little bit of work in. And so she says to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. And so she says, go, sleep with my maidservant, Hagar. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. In verse 3, there is an illusion. It's an illusion to the moment in the garden. The moment in the garden when the woman saw the fruit, saw that it was good to eat. She took of it and she gave some to her husband. The very same verbs are used in Genesis 3 to speak of Sarai who took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And the person who is reading Genesis, the person whom Moses is writing to, who are reading this in the Hebrew, they would have caught that. They would have caught that illusion. They would have caught that. They would have understood that what is happening here has a negative connotation to it. This is not what God intends. This is living by sight, not by faith. This is seeking to grab on to the promises of God by one's own effort, by one's own creativity, by one's own desire, by one's own work. Just like our parents in the garden. who said, this fruit is good for making one wise. I will take. I will eat. And so, the story of the curse continues. The story of sin remains. This is Abram. Father Abraham the father of the faithful. A patriarch who has great faith. But he is far from perfect. He concedes to his wife's idea to take Hagar as his wife and to have children through her But this causes tensions in their relationship. When Hagar finds out she's pregnant, she begins to despise her mistress and mistreat her. Look down upon her. See, look, I am the one that can have a child through your husband, Abram. You, you're barren. In those days, to be barren was heavily looked down upon. And so Sarai said to Abram, because in this legal uh, situation, Abram's now been given to, or Hagar's now been given to Abram, 
as his wife, and so has in essence become uh, Abram's maidservant, Abram's uh, slave. And so Sarai goes after Hagar is mistreating her, despising her, and she says, you're responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms. Now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. And may the Lord judge between you and me. And so this is what uh, Abram does. Anytime that your wife is upset with you and says that it's your fault, just take note, okay? You say, okay, it's in your hands. You deal with it. That's what he says, okay? Your servant is in your hands. Whatever it is that's going on between you and Hagar, you deal with it how you seem fit, okay? Do whatever you think best, honey, darling, babe. Then Sarai returned the mistreatment to Hagar. And so this mistreatment that Hagar is experiencing, we don't know what, the, what it is, but it's so bad that she flees from her. Out of the camp of Abram. Out and away. This is what happens when we seek to live by sight and not by faith. This is what happens when we seek to capture, grab onto the promises of God by our own work, by our own effort. Dissension, pain, hurt, jealousy. It destroys us. It wrecks our life. The question we have to ask is, in those moments... Because we have to, we have to uh, be real with ourselves here. We are like Abram. We go to our Genesis 15 moments of believing in God and God crediting it to us as righteousness, right? Um, a great moment and expression of faith to our Genesis 16 moments. Sometimes in the matter of a day. I believe, God. Help me with my unbelief. God, I believe you. I, I'm clinging to your promises. The next moment, I'm saying, God, how is this going to happen? How are you going to come through? God, I'm trusting in you, but God, this addiction, this addiction is so strong, it's, it's calling me, it's destroying my life. God, I believe you and I trust you, but God, how am I going to pay for this bill? How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with this situation, this financial struggle? God, I believe you and I trust you and, and I am standing with you and I believe that I have all that I need in Jesus Christ. And, and God, I am at my wit's end with my children and I'm being rude and I'm being, dis, uh, I'm being mean-spirited with them and I don't know what to do. That's me in a nutshell. And maybe deep down inside us, we may not even say these things, but we think to ourselves, doesn't God get tired of us? Doesn't he get tired of us? of us flip-flopping back and forth like this? Of us living by faith and then living by sight and living by faith and living by sight? We want to live quorum Deo before the face of God. And sometimes we do and other times... We feel like we can hide from God. We can do things in secret. We can we 
We're just a ball of paradoxes. What does the God who sees do when we are like this? We see that what's interesting about this whole situation in Genesis chapter 16 is God's dealings are with Abram and his wife Sarai. God's dealings are with him. His promises are with him. His covenant is with him. And uh, the one who is mistreated in this situation because Abram and Sarai are living by sight and not by faith, who are desiring to grab onto the promises of God by their own work and by their own effort and not trusting and depending and waiting and relying upon God, um, is Hagar. So Hagar, she runs away from her master. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar. And he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? By the way, every time I read that, I just keep thinking, where have you come from and where are you going? Cotton Eye Joe. Like, that's what that sounds like. I don't know if you know that song, but. Random. She answers the angel of the Lord. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord comes to her and she says, go back to your mistress, Submit to her. And the angel of the Lord adds a promise. I will increase your descendants. They'll be too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord spoke over. You're now with child. You'll have a son. And you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You're the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. The angel of the Lord here, the messenger of God Almighty, Many, be, many people believe that because he is the one who's given the authority to be the messenger of God Almighty, he can speak on God's behalf. Uh, some people believe that this is a pre-incarnate Christ who comes in this moment. Um, I'm privy to that interpretation. Some people believe this is simply to uh, a, a theophany, uh, a visible appearance of God. Nonetheless, what we do learn is that God is seeing this whole thing carry out. Sarai give Hagar to Abram. Abram go into Hagar. Hagar is pregnant. Hagar begins to despise her, her uh, Sarai. Sarai um, begins to mistreat Hagar. Hagar runs off into the wilderness. And God comes and he asks, what's going on? Well, God knows. God sees. The two things that we learn about this encounter is that the son shall be called Ishmael because God hears and that Hagar calls God the God who sees. The living one who sees. You remember that living before the face of God is the recognition that God hears all things, God sees all things, and we desire to live in such a way that we are living before his face. Before the blessing of his face. God sees. God hears. But the interesting thing that I find about this whole encounter is that God does not go to Abram and to Sarai and appear to them and say, Woe to you who live by sight and not by faith. God does not go to Abram and Sarai and say, How dare you try to grab on to the promises of God by your own work and by your own effort. No, God appears to the slave girl. The one who has been ping-ponged back and forth between the two people that God is in covenant with, that God is in dealing with, because they sought to live and to grasp 
the promises of God by their own work and their own effort. And he reveals himself to her. And he grants her promises that should comfort her as she lives under the obedience of submission to Sarai, her master. She, the God who sees, says, I'll increase your descendants. The Lord has heard of your misery. And it's through God coming to this slave woman, Hagar, expressing that he is the one who sees. He is the one who hears misery. That we know that it is the heart of God to be gracious to us in Christ. Even when we live by sight and not by faith. Because if Hagar had ran away, that would have been one of Abram's sons gone. So God has intentions here to teach something, to show something. God is being gracious to Abram and to Sarai in Christ, even though they are living by sight and not by faith, even though they are seeking to grab on to the promises of God by their own work and by their own effort, even though they are not living before the face of God. God still sees them. God still hears them. And God is still at work. So you've got to ask yourself the question, does God ever get tired of my back and forth, up and down? No. He does not. When you become worried and overwhelmed because you're like Abram and Sarai, waiting and waiting year after year for the promises of God to come to fulfillment in your life, you begin to question, you begin to ponder, and you begin to wonder, and you're asking God, when's this going to happen? When's this going to come about? How am I supposed to know that you can be trusted? How am I supposed to know that you, you can be counted on when you are experiencing those things and when you fall to the temptation to begin to live by sight, live by what you can grasp in this world, when you begin to fall to the temptation to maybe grab onto the promises of God by your own work and by your own effort, not waiting, not depending upon God, God does not abandon you and will not abandon you. In those moments, he comes to us as the God who hears our misery, as the God who sees us. And he is gracious to us in Christ. Often, turning us back from living by sight. Granting us the grace that we need to live by faith. And remembering, giving us a remembrance that we must rely upon Him and wait upon Him. And remember that all the promises of God find their yes and their amen in Jesus Christ. Do you know that? I pray you do. I pray you know that when you live by sight, there is a God who sees. And that God who sees does not condemn you, but graciously graciously provides for you. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have granted to us
salvation in Jesus Christ by faith in him, we, we are redeemed. We are new creatures made whole. But it's true, Lord, that just because we have been saved and redeemed does not mean that we are not also like Abram, one who has great faith in one moment and one who stumbles, who begins to live by sight. The next moment. And so we ask, Lord, that in Jesus Christ you would help us to see your grace and your love and your mercy for our weaknesses, for the moments in which we begin to doubt, to wonder if we can trust you, to say that we've waited too long Whatever it may be, Lord, that we may be struggling with, we pray that we would see in Jesus Christ that you are the God who sees, the God who hears our misery, that you are the God who is gracious to us in Christ.